What are relays? How do they work? How can we use them in our vehicles and other electrical circuits? I'm going to show you now. Hi YouTube, my name is Jeff and I'm the Veg Oil Guy. Today I'm going to be looking at relays and their use in vehicle electrical circuits. This was a subscriber requested video and I always do my best to help out my subscribers. A couple of guys contacted me separately for advice. Both I think had a good idea of what they wanted to do and how they were going to go about it, but I think they were just looking for a second opinion. One subscriber wanted to fit courtesy lights under each of his car doors. Another one wanted to fit a third braking light. The answer to both of them is simple. Use a relay. Splice into the parent circuit and use the live feed to prime and trigger the relay. Wire a separate fuse line through the output terminals of the relay to power the new device. This safely powers the new device and circumvents any danger of overpowering the original circuit and possibly blown a fuse. If all of this makes perfect sense to you, then in honesty, this video probably isn't for you. If I've left you scratching your head a bit, then don't worry. I'm about to take you through the basics of relays, explain what they are, how they work and what we can use them for. Then I'll address the issues raised by my subscribers, explain the answer fully and even provide a demo test circuit to prove it all works. To begin with, if you've absolutely no idea about auto electrics, then please look at my Fusedit video. This will give you all the information you need to follow along. It might also be worthwhile taking a look at my splicing video, as this will show you how to safely make electrical connections with a soldering iron. And that's the only way I really recommend making electrical connections. So what is a relay? A relay is simply an electronic switch. They come in different shapes and sizes, and usually have four or more metal lugs sticking out of them. These are terminals or pins. But what's going on inside them is what's really important. Here's a really simple circuit. There's a battery, a bulb and a switch. It's easy to see what happens when the switch is closed. The bulb goes on. The problem here, of course, is that someone has always got to close the switch. What a relay does is electronically close the switch for you. Originally, relays were tiny electromagnets. When you place power into them, this created a magnetic field which attracted or repelled metallic strips inside them and this formed the arms of a switch. Turn on the electromagnet, the switch closes. Turn it off, the switch opens. Now I'm not really sure whether all relays are electromagnets these days, but the principle remains the same. They cause a switch to open or close. Historically, the standard electronic symbol for a relay was something like this. And you can certainly get the idea from this that a magnet is involved, as you can see a coil. For this purpose, I'm going to draw my relays a little differently. This is the electromagnet and this is the switch. The large round points are terminals or pins of the relay. To energize the electromagnet, we need to connect power to the terminals that cause the switch to close. So if we wire a bulb and a battery to these switched terminals of the relay, it's easy to see how the relay can be used to switch the bulb on and off. Tell you what, I'll put a master switch in here so we can see this working. There you go, I know it's a manual switch, don't worry about that. There's nothing special or fancy about this master switch, we'll just call it that for clarity's sake. So this is a relay in its most basic form, a four pin normally open relay, four pins for four terminals, and normally open because the switch is open until power is applied to the relay. Close the master switch and the relay is energized. The relay switch is closed, lighting the bulb. Open the master switch and everything goes off. And this is probably the relay that's most often needed. And it's certainly the one that my subscribers would need, a four pin normally open relay. But there are different types of relay. The first obvious variation is the 4-pin normally closed relay. At first glance there's no obvious difference, but the difference lies within the internal switch. When the relay is not energised, when the electromagnet is not on, the internal switch is still in a closed position. If you energise the electromagnet, then the relay switch opens. Sometimes it's useful to have a circuit that is on most of the time and you only want to interrupt it occasionally and that's where a normally closed relay would be of real use. The next variation is the 5-pin relay. As the name suggests, 
these simply have another terminal. However, this extra terminal gives us a relay that is both normally open and normally closed. This is extremely useful. Personally, I only tend to buy 5 pin relays as there's virtually no price difference between a 4 and a 5 pin and a 5 pin can do everything a 4 pin can and a little bit more. For instance, let's have a 5 pin relay to light the same sort of bulb circuit that we saw with a 4 pin relay. You can see it here. Close the master switch and the bulb is lit. Open the master switch and off the bulb goes. However, the clever bit with a 5 pin relay is that it can control two circuits. Let's put in another bulb and put it across our fifth pin. Now see what happens. With the master switch closed, one bulb is lit, but the other bulb isn't. With the master switch open, the reverse is true. And that's because there's a normally open and a normally closed element at play here. One thing that's missing from my diagram here is numbers. Most relays come with numbers, and to the best of my knowledge, this is a fairly universal number system for relays. Who came up with these numbers, I don't know, but the knowledge of these numbers is very helpful. Each pin on a relay is normally numbered, and by knowing what each number represents, as shown here, then you know how to use them and how to wire them up properly. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say on the matter of relays, to be honest. There are variations on relays, I believe, but I'm not concerned with those in this particular video. And if you do a search on eBay or Amazon, you're going to see that there's a lot of relays to choose from. And the main differences there lie in the power that is needed to activate them and the power that they can actually handle. Now, that is actually the real reason behind relays. That's their real use. That's why your average vehicle is littered with them. It's all about the power. Generally, it takes very little current to energize a relay. And where there's very little current, the average human can safely handle things. For instance, it could be a switch on your dashboard. You don't want massive metal melting power surging through a switch if you're going to be handling it all the time. You just want a tiny bit of power. But at the other end of the circuit, that's where you need it to handle real juice. And that's where the relay comes in. It can handle all the dangerous power that would normally fry us. If you're at all unsure about the sort of relay you're going to need in your vehicle, pretty much any vehicle related relay will work. These are usually powered by 12 volts as that's the standard voltage for most vehicles and they can carry varying amounts of current, normally 10 amps, 30 amps, etc. Probably 10 amps will do most projects that I can think of. Uh, but your project, obviously, you're going to need to check it out first. What is the power that you're going to need to handle? If it's a great big amp or something like that, it might take massive amount of power. You need to look into that first. So what's the maximum amount of current it can take? And then you want to make sure that your relay can handle that. What's the amount that you need to activate it? That's normally the voltage of the vehicle, 12 volts. Obviously, check the requirements of the item that you're installing and obviously be aware of the power of your own vehicle. So with the basic explanation out of the way, let's come back to my subscribers' requests. One wanted to power courtesy lights. One wanted to fit a third braking light. Both wondered if they could simply splice into an existing circuit and add more lights, etc. And as a general rule, I would say no, that's a bad practice. Sure, you might get away with it for a while, but if you draw too much current, you could blow a fuse and you might find yourself driving down the road with no brake lights or even worse. The sensible suggestion in both cases is to create a new, separate, independently fused circuit. A piggyback fuse holder would be ideal way of getting the necessary power that you need. See my video on the subject if you're not sure. But how do we get this new circuit to work alongside the one that's already there? How do we get the new brake light, for example, to come on when the old one comes on? How do we get the new courtesy lights to come on when the old one comes on? The answer is simple. We use a relay. Sticking with the example of brake lights for a moment, if we splice into the original or the parent circuit, as we call it, we can use this live spliced cable to energize our relay. The relay uses so little current that there's virtually no danger of overpowering the original circuit. 
so everything's safe that way, no fuses are going to blow. The piggyback supply can then be fed through the output terminals of the relay and that can be used to power the new brake light without any concerns of overtaxing the original circuit at all. So with all the theory out of the way, let's look at a real demonstration. Now here we are inside my shed and here's a scrap bit of board with a few components on it, but it could just as easily be inside my car. Let's have a look what we've actually got. Well, we've got the main power supply, which is the battery, the positive and the negative. And there's a switch. Now the switch is whatever activates the circuit, be it a brake pedal, a door opening, whatever. And we've got a light bulb. Now the light bulb could be a headlight, it could be a brake light, it could be a courtesy light, it could even be an aircon unit. It doesn't matter. The important thing is here, click the switch, the light goes on. Great. Everything's working exactly how we'd expect it. That's what's happening in the vehicle right now. But we want to add something else here. We want to add something new. We're going to add another light. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm going to add LEDs. Now, these LEDs are fantastic, to be honest. And in many ways, they'd be the perfect answer for both my subscribers. Uh, these things come on a strip. They're waterproof. They cut them to length. They're marvellous things. They come in a variety of colours, so you could just as easily use them as a brake light. Or you can stick them underneath your car doors for the courtesy light because they've got an adhesive backing. They're fantastic. But they're going to represent the new item in this circuit. So here's my circuit. Pause the video if you need to see it any longer. But this is the circuit that my subscribers would need to be worried about. And here's the actual application. Everything's on a board wired up inside my shed. You can see the original light. And now there's a small LED strip. And of course, a relay. Click the switch, the original light comes on, but nothing else. Why? Because there's no power there yet. It's only the original fuse in place. So let's plug in a piggyback fuse holder. And now let's also plug in the original fuse into the piggyback. Now everything works. The original circuit is still fused and completely intact. The new circuit has a separate fuse, a separate supply and is powered through the relay. And the relay is energized by a splice from the original parent circuit the blue wire that you can see coming up from the white connector block there. So let's just check everything. Let's give it all a quick test. Let's remove the new red fuse. That's the one for the new circuit. Sure enough, the LED doesn't work anymore, but the original light still comes on. Even though the relay's energized, even though there's power in that relay, there's no power coming through the piggy fuse anymore. So, the LED strip doesn't light, but the original circuit is still intact. Perfect. But let's put the red fuse back and take the green fuse out. So the original fuse is now removed. What happens now? Well, nothing. There may be power to the red fuse, but the relay is not being activated by the original circuit anymore. It can't be because there's no fuse in the original circuit. Put everything back in and everything works great so there we have it an independent circuit operating through a relay and yet energized by the original parent circuit it's as easy as that now it's time for a few handy relay tips relays often come with holders like this this makes wiring them up much easier all you need to do is just a little bit of splicing if you're not using a holder then you'll either need to solder wires to each terminal or you'll need to use spade connectors. If you're going to use spade connectors, make sure that they're a nice tight fit. If necessary, you squeeze them with pliers. You don't want them coming off. Ideally purchase the fully insulated spade connectors, not like the ones you can see me using. Remember, it's quite possible that a spade connector can come loose and be flapping around. And if that's a live wire, it can lead to all kinds of terrible things. So if the end is insulated, fantastic. So if you're going to use the same sort as me, please make sure you wrap it well with insulation tape. Another tip before installation 
clean the pins of the relay with fine sandpaper. This aids conductivity and ensures a good electrical connection. Once cleaned, lightly brush the terminals with petroleum jelly. You can use the proper contact jelly if you prefer, but personally I've found that petroleum jelly is just as good at preventing oxidisation etc, i.e. stopping those terminals from getting dirty, which can lead to poor connections and electrical failures. It just takes a few seconds and it could save you all manner of troubles in the long run. And I think that's it folks, I think we've got a finished video. I hope you found this video helpful and I hope everything was nice and clear. Please remember, I'm no expert, I'm just a keen amateur. So it's always worthwhile checking out what other people say on the subject. So do look around YouTube and other websites. This was a subscriber requested video and I was happy to oblige. If you have a video request, do get in touch. If I can help, I certainly will. If you enjoyed watching this video, then please like it. If you didn't like it, then why not let me know why? I'm always eager to improve my videos. Your comments and your questions are always welcome, and I really love to hear from you, so do drop me a message below. Please do check out my YouTube channel and of course my other videos. I've got 40 plus videos out there now and I'm receiving some fantastic feedback and some real interest from subscribers so thank you all very much for that it's really appreciated and if you haven't subscribed yet then please do so but for now that's it folks thanks very much for watching